Hello and welcome to the 2021 Virtual CHW Summit hosted by Umemba Health. I am so glad to be speaking today. My name is Leonor Okwara. I am the CEO and founder of Public Health Research Consulting, and it is my pleasure today to talk about the value that CHWs bring to research projects. So we do have a couple of housekeeping items that I want to address and make sure um, that you all know how to complete the survey and get your continuing education credits. So I have my notes. I'm going to read it here to make sure I give you accurate instructions. So this is a pre-recorded session, but the Q&A section of the Thinkific platform is being monitored to respond to any questions that you may have. To access the Q&A box, you can access the discussion tab at the top right of your course player whenever you have a question to ask. The course player is where you're watching this video now. Just click on the image of the two alternating boxes, then create new posts to submit your question. Questions will only be answered on the day the presentation premieres. Today's slides and any additional resources pertaining to this presentation are made available inside the Thinkific platform. You can find them by scrolling down past this video. As a reminder, we are asking everyone to complete a survey about the session. The survey is located inside the Thinkific platform and you will be prompted to complete the survey at the end of the presentation. But if you are not prompted to complete the survey, you can find it in the summit outline. Additionally, please complete the survey at the completion of the week. These are very important because Umemba Health uses every bit of feedback to help inform future educational events. Just a reminder, this presentation has been approved for continuing education hours for CHWs, CHW instructors, and certified health education specialists. So in order to obtain your certificate, you must complete the summit evaluation by April 23rd, so don't miss your window. Join us on social media. Use the hashtags to share what you've learned um, and anything you'd like to share with others um, that may help them do the amazing work that they're doing. Follow on Facebook and Instagram um, and be sure to just take pictures of yourself, screenshots, and post it on social media. So let's get started. My name is Leonor Oquara. I am a public health researcher and founder of Public Health Research Consulting. My website is publichealthresearchconsulting.com. Today I'll be talking about community engagement and research, the foundation for community health workers. Let's talk a little bit about me. I have a bachelor's in sociology and a master's in public health and epidemiology. Although I did not go into the epidemiology field, um, I more or less entered the research, the health education, health promotion field. So I am a military spouse. My husband has been in the military since 2004. Yeah, it's coming up on retirement. It's crazy how time flies. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to travel across the country and work on different research teams, which means that I've had the pleasure of engaging with so many different communities and helping to build trust in the research process and learning how to develop meaningful and trusting relationships with people that I've just met. And I am also a mom of three. I have two girls and a son. So in terms of my professional experience, I started out as a research assistant where I did a lot of just recruiting in the community, the boots on the ground work, where I'm knocking door to door, talking to people about research, talking to them about why it's important for them to participate and really hearing their stories and addressing their concerns. Um, so my role was primarily focused on participant recruitment and collecting data. So not only did I recruit and do participant outreach, but I also collected survey data and did interviews with people. 
Then um, I was promoted to a research coordinator position. So here I was responsible for my own research study. So in addition to doing recruiting and collecting data, I did a lot of the paperwork and the budgeting and ordering supplies for that particular research study. So I had a little bit of um, more responsibility in that position. And then now I have been a research program manager since about 2013. And that is where I am managing multiple studies. I'm managing an entire research lab. So I deal with a lot of the extra stuff. While I still do participant recruitment and direct community engagement, I'm also responsible for supervising um, students and research assistants and also doing hiring and writing grants and all of that admin stuff. I'm also certified, I have a micro-credential as a community-engaged professional, and this is just a way to say that over my career, I've done a lot of community engagement to show that I'm able to be certified in this. So I do want to start with an example because I feel that that will really help guide um, the presentation. So the Health Advocates in Reach and Research Campaign. This is affectionately known as HAIR. And as you can see, this is a picture of a barber shop. You have black men getting their haircuts, you know, seem to be engaged in conversation and smiling. And this is led um, by Dr. Stephen B. Thomas at University of Maryland in College Park. And this is an amazing example of true community engaged research. So what he did um, was identify a problem. He realized that um, colorectal cancer rates among um, black people were really high. And he knew he had to figure out a way to get the word out about increasing screening as well as increasing knowledge about colorectal cancer. But when you're doing community work, you can't just go to the community and say, you need to go get screened for colorectal cancer, um, especially when you throw research in there and the fact that you may not, they may not know you, um, it's not gonna be successful. So what Dr. Thomas did was go to barber shops and beauty salons and he used them as that trusted figure because when you think about it in the black community, aside from the church, the barber shops and the beauty salons um, are really the trusted figures. You know, black people have a hard time talking to each other and their families about health. But when you sit in that chair at the barbershop or the beauty salon, it's like you're in therapy. You know, you share your, mo your most private thoughts. And so Dr. Thomas thought this would be a good way to bridge the community and research. So what he did was um, created this study called HAIR that promotes colorectal cancer screening among the black community. And he trained barbers and hairstylists as lay health advisors. So they're serving in that CHW role, so to speak. But what happened was he needed to build trust with those trusted figures before um, they accepted it because they have a role to play and a duty to their community to make sure whatever they're telling them, they believe in as well. So Dr. Thomas trained them and what they did was they collected data. They collected um, health histories, family health histories from their customers. Because as I mentioned before, black people, black families have a hard time talking about health um, and sharing um, their health history. So the barbers and the hairstylists did this. And so they collected that information. They provided health education around the importance of colorectal cancer early detection. They talked about the importance of screening. And this was so successful um, that from this study, there were more that were created that were like it, but they focused on other things. So they focused on flu, COVID vaccines, and just general health and wellness. So you can see involving those trusted figures and providing them with the information that they need to take back to the community can prove to be really successful as it was here. So what is community engaged research? As you could see from the example, 
the primary goal is to build trust. It should be to build trust. Some researchers um, have different priorities in mind, but that's why I am sharing this information with you. So if you do ever decide to go into the research field, um, you will know how to communicate this information to the research team, but their priority should be building trust. Um, community engaged research requires a partnership. You saw in the hair example, the um, barbers and the stylists had to be on board with what was happening. Um, and that is where that partnership was created. Dr. Thomas made sure they felt comfortable with their role and they felt comfortable with what they had to do to encourage the community to change their health behavior. It requires cooperation, negotiation, because sometimes a researcher can tell the trusted figure, um, do this, and that trusted figure or lay health advisor may say, I don't want to. So it requires some back and forth and um, those two parties to be able to come to an agreement. It also requires a commitment to addressing local health issues. And it's really including the community in the research process. So as you saw, Dr. Thomas trained the barbers and stylists um, to be key parts of implementing that research study. It thrives on a genuine relationship between the community and the researcher. This is where a lot of researchers fail. They don't have a genuine relationship. Um, they communicate with um, the community in order to collect the information they need for their study and they leave. So community engaged research really requires the, a genuine relationship for it to work. And um, I can tell you now, I follow Dr. Stephen B. Thomas's work and he is connected. He shows up in the community. He does so much for the community um, that they don't mind whenever he has research studies and needs them to be a part of it. They jump at the opportunity. Um, and so there is a type of research approach called community-based participatory research or CBPR, which you all may hear about, um, especially if you're interested in the research field. And this is just the approach that is like the epitome of all types of community engaged research, because you're not only involving the community in the health education part of the study, but you are involving them in every step of the research process. So let's go through the research process. If you look at the image, um, the circle, you will see the top circle says identifying the problem. So just as we mentioned, I mentioned in the hair study, Dr. Thomas identified the problem and that was that colorectal cancer rates were super high in the black community. And so that's the first part of the research process is identifying the problem. Next, you want to look into the literature. You want to see what other researchers have done in the area. You want to see what the, the data, the health data actually say about the rates of the condition that you're looking to study. But then also you want to do a needs assessment. So you don't just want to, you know, look at the data and see what it says. You actually want to go to the community and get their take on it because you may see it's a problem. You may read that it's a problem, but when you go into the community, they may tell you it's not a problem. They may focus, want to focus on something else. Um, and then next, you'll formulate the hypothesis or figure out what question you're trying to answer. Dr. Thomas's case, he was trying to figure out how to increase knowledge of colorectal cancer and how to increase screening of colorectal cancer in the black community. Then you want to prepare the research design. So what all this means is how am I going to answer the question? What do I need to do to answer the question? Then you move down to the data collection or intervention phase. So this is where you collect that data. Um, so just like the barbers were doing collecting family health history information, that's considered part of the data collection process. You have all this information, you have to do something with it. So you analyze it, you come out with some numbers, and then you have to interpret those numbers. Um, you have to figure out, did this make an impact? Was I able to answer my research question? What does this all mean? And you write reports on it. 
you write a scientific report, should also write a lay report. Uh, what I hear a lot from the community is researchers come in and they collect our information and then they leave and we don't know what happened. Like, what did they find from the questions we answer? After you write the report, you want to disseminate that information. So you don't just want it sitting there, you want to get it out into the community. And typically researchers do this by um, submitting to scientific journals or submitting to present at um, national conferences. Um, but you also want to make sure, as I said before, that you're getting this information out to the community. So this is the research process. And what I have circled are key parts of the process that CHWs would be valuable in leading efforts um, in this respect. So it would be in um, the phase where you are doing the needs assessment. This is front facing direct engagement with the communities and CHWs could totally be integral in this process. Also data collection um, or implementing the intervention um, is key to have trusted figures and someone who already is comfortable with engaging the community leading this effort. Interpreting, um, researchers tend to think with a scientific hat instead of um, from the lay perspective. So this is where CHWs would be key because you know how to communicate the information appropriately to the community. And then dissemination, you know how to get the information in front of who it needs to get in front of. So you remember a slide ago, I was talking about this long research approach called community-based participatory research or CBPR. And I said, it is just like the top of the line type of community engagement because it involves the community in each part of the research process. So imagine this research process map with all of the circles being read. That's what CBPR is. It's including the community and decision making in all aspects of the research process, which should be the goal of all researchers. So two questions that I want to ask with very easy answers. How important is community connection to research success? Crucial. What role does a trusted figure play in the research process? Major. As you can see from the example I provided, the community connection was crucial to research success. Without those trusted figures being a part of the research process, they would not have had the success that they had. And they would not have seen sustained success after the research study was over. So we talked about um, what community engaged research is. We talked about what the research process is. Now I want to empower you to let you know that you as CHWs have that experience that you need to meet research needs. You understand the community being served. Unlike any other, researchers have to work hard to get to know their community, but you are already out there doing that boots on the ground work, the daily interaction, have, and you have established relationships with the community. So you have direct knowledge of building relationships and trust. It's not something that is scary for you. It's something that's second nature to you. You also have experience with patient outreach or participant outreach. You also know how to educate the community on health and how to take that hard to understand concept and explain it in a way that the community member can take that information and be confident and change their behavior, which means you definitely have an influence over behavior change. You are community advocates. And I think this is what's key in research because the community is often afraid of researchers and rightfully so because of the historical mistrust of researchers. Um, I mean, we've heard about all of those horrible studies that have happened um, in the past and CHWs are just strong advocates for the community. So the community will know that if there's something that isn't quite right, CHWs are their allies and will be able to stand up for them um, to help um, 
to help them do the researchers do what is right. They're also the mediators. Um, so earlier I mentioned, you know, the negotiation. There, there's sometimes things happen that don't seem right, um, and the CHWs are really that that liaison between the two groups who can speak the language of the researcher, but then also speak the language of the community to make everyone comfortable. So you guys are phenomenal. You're already doing the work, and this is exactly what the research field needs. So I want to talk more about that. Um, you know, we talked about the experience you already have, but from the research perspective, I want to talk about why you are so valuable. And these are things you need to use if you're interested in doing research. This is, these are phrases that you should use in your resume, and I'll talk about that. Um, but also during your interview and you, in your cover letter, this is information that you should include. So why use CHWs in research? You all increase researcher community awareness. As I said, the researcher is focused on completing the study, although that shouldn't be their priority. Sometimes it is. For some, it isn't. But CHWs help researchers become more aware of the community and help them learn the community. You guys also increase the community's acceptance of research because they trust you and because they see that you accept it, it's easier for them to accept it. Um, CHWs increase outreach to hard to reach um, populations. Sometimes it is difficult for researchers to get their foot in the door with certain communities, but CHWs already have a relationship with. CHWs improve community participation and retention. And we've seen that a number of times in all of the literature that's out there, the value of CHWs and helping participants remain in the study and complete their study visits. CHWs maximize community benefit, brings the community perspective and voice to the process. Um, because you all know the community, you're able to speak from their perspective, you understand um, what may seem wrong to them, you understand what they may respond to best. So you really do represent the community in a way that researchers really need on their team. And most importantly, you build trustworthy and sustainable community relationships. That sustainable part is so, so important. You don't just want to get in there, do research for a few years and then leave. You want this to be something that is in the community long term and continues to be beneficial. To so we talked about the experience that you all have. We talked about the value of CHWs in research. Now I want to talk about some of the roles and responsibilities that CHWs can have on a research team. First, facilitating coalition and community advisory board meetings. These boards are crucial. And I say that a lot, but I really feel like um, there are certain parts of a research process that make or break the success um, of the research um, outcomes. So having a community advisory board on a research team is key to success. A community advisory board can include um, people who are um, survivors or patients with the topic or of interest. Um, they can be their caregivers, they can be physicians who treat that certain condition, um, or they can be organization leaders that provide resources to people with that condition. But CHWs would be phenomenal in facilitating these meetings. Community advisory boards are there um, to sort of do check-in. So if you come up with um, certain ideas on engaging the community or approaches you want to use, you run it by the community advisory board to get their input and, and see what they think about it. CHWs um, also can um, lead efforts in collaborating with local officials and organizations. So really expanding the network and expanding partnerships. Crucial in marketing and communication efforts. A lot of times researchers are looking at things um, from a scientific lens. So if they create flyers, it may not be um, using plain language or the correct imagery. Um, and so CHWs know how to communicate 
complicated information to the community. So in getting the word out about the research study and how best to do that, CHW should be leading this effort and do on many research teams. Participant recruitment. You guys are masters at um, patient outreach. And so this is uh, one of the key roles of CHWs on a research team, collecting data, implementing the intervention, and also explaining the research findings and translating those reports for the lay community. Remember in that research process circle, we talked about interpreting findings. We talked about disseminating that information because you don't wanna leave the community hanging. You wanna to talk to them about what you found as a way to say thank you for participating. Now let us show you um, the important points that we pulled out from the information you gave us. So this all leads to preparing for a research career. And I want to talk a little bit about, you know, your resume and job search. So you want to use research specific skills that I mentioned earlier. Go back and take those phrases and um, some of those key terms and update your resume if you're interested in research, but then also include it in your cover letter and go in and explain how you um, communicate health information to the community in a way that they understand. How do you take that complicated scientific information and tell the community in a way that they feel confident um, and empowered to change their behavior? How do you build trust within the community? How do you network with other organizations? What do you do if someone um, doesn't understand what you're saying? How do you communicate information back to the organization? So provide real life examples of how you've engaged the community and how you've built trust and really um, highlight those areas because often that is something that the researchers are lacking. Some positions that you can look for in your job search, research assistant, lay health advisor, outreach worker, community health ambassador, and research coordinator. There are also a couple um, of memberships that you may want to look into. They're all related to um, health literacy and using plain language, but I feel um, that that's an important skill that research teams need, and you all are already prepped to be able to um, communicate this information to the community. So um, being a part of a group or an organization um, that that's all they focus on, you will learn so many strategies that'll make you even better um, able to communicate information. So that's the International Health Literacy Association and the Institute for Healthcare Advancement Health Literacy Solutions Center. There's some research trainings and webinars that I do want to talk to you about. Um, I always talk to people and say, learning the research process is easy. It's that community engagement part that's hard um, because it's the most important part of the process. So California State University Fullerton has a CBPR training. Um, also Johns Hopkins has a CBPR Co Coursera course. Um, and though as of today, those were still free. So it would be great for you all to um, participate in those. Also, my company, Public Health Research Consulting, um, I provide a program management for research success masterclass. So if you um, are in the research field and you want some tips on how to better manage or coordinate a research study, um, I do offer a masterclass for that. I also last year had the pleasure of hosting the first Research and Communities of Color virtual summit. And the goal with that was to increase engagement in research and communities of color, specifically the black community. I had 12 speakers who came on uh, most of them researchers and gave strategies on how they've been able to do that successfully. I also have a LinkedIn group. It's called Public Health Research Network. Um, it's just a community where you can go and find jobs and also um, just research tips and trainings that may help you in your career. I also host a podcast called Public Health Culture. 
where the focus is increasing community engagement in public health initiatives and research. As you can see, I'm just big on community engagement and really building trust around research. And so with that podcast, I interview a number of professionals who are leading initiatives in research and they share their strategies on how they've been able to successfully engage the community in their work. So if you need any ideas, you can go there. Also, again, my website is publichealthresearchconsulting.com. Thank you so much.